Hi and welcome to Terry Talks Movie Set Science Fiction Saturday once more and I have a box set for you which I received from Biovision and it's pretty damn good, it's chock full of childhood nostalgia and interesting special effects and it's this The Super Marionation Collection which has 4 TV series in it Fireball XL5 Stingray Captain Scarlet and the Mysterons and Joe Knighty, all on DVD. It's not a Blu-ray, but I don't think with uh, TV of this quality, and by quality I mean the quality of the production, you really need to go further up. A 4K or a Blu-ray release of these would be of very little extra value. I don't think it would be at all commercially viable. But this is a nice, chunky, and really solid box set. There's a ton of online material about Jerry and Sylvia Anderson, and the work they did with their marionettes to create interesting series all through the 1960s for us to enjoy as children. This is your Saturday morning fodder. This is the stuff you got up, ate your cereal, sat cross-legged in front of a black and white television and enjoyed. We'll start with Fireball XL5, which is the only black and white one of the four in the box set. It was filmed in 1962 and I believe released in 1962. And it's set in the year 2062, which makes sense, I suppose. It's the missions of the Earth spaceship Fireball XL5 commanded by Steve Zodiac of the World Space Patrol. Zodiac's crew comprises Dr. Venus, an authority on space medicine. That's the, that's the female character voiced by Sylvia Anderson. Engineer and navigator Professor Matthew Matic. Mathematic, yeah. And the co-pilot is Robert, a transparent anthropomorphic robot. Voiced by Jerry Anderson using an artificial larynx. People had throat cancers, they had the vibrator thing in their throat. That's what Jerry Anderson himself used for the voice of Robert. It's kind of a low retina for a robot, really, isn't it? Given the fact that it's only six years after Robbie the Robot in the Forbidden Planet. Bit lazy there. Like many of the Jerry and Sylvia Anderson series, it's got a catchy theme song. Sung by an Australian actor who's still around, a guy called Don Spencer, who between 2003 and 2018 was the father-in-law of Russell Crowe. His daughter Danny all married Russell Crowe. They've since parted, but for a while he was Russell Crowe's father-in-law. Now Ian Fry, who is a supporter of the channel, said this about Fireball XL5. He said it was a space western and he argued that Steve Zodiac essentially plays the role of an interplanetary sheriff. He also said that Professor Matthew Maddox sounds a lot like Gabby Hayes from the old westerns. And he compared Venus to Marletta Dietrich in Destry Rides Again. And I could see that. I, I read the stuff that Ian had written about it. And then I watched the first episode of the series and I went, yeah, I, I can buy that. So thanks, Ian, for those insights. Of the four in the box set, Fireball XL5 for me is about equal third with uh, the last of the four. Uh, I like a lot of the set design and of course the production design that Jerry and Sylvia Anderson did was next level. And the other strange thing is that there was a copycat TV series done in the UK just around the same time or a little bit later called Space Patrol which is incredibly basic. I'll put a little bit of the video from Space Patrol up here and you can compare it to what you've seen of Fireball XL5. Yeah, um, sometimes copying things doesn't work. And the Asylum isn't the first studio in history to copy something better in order to get a few bucks. It's a pity it wasn't in colour because there's some really nice colour production stills there of Fireball XL5. But this is still very early in Jerry and Sylvia Anderson's production phase. And they probably didn't have the resources to do colour. Bit of a shame, but... Fireball XL5 is a nice inclusion. I've already got this other series they did around the same time, Supercar, which for me is a lot more fun. I, I think I like Supercar a little bit more than Fireball XL5. Let me know what you think. Next we go to 1964 and the first of the colour series that Jerry and Sylvia Anderson did, Stingray, which is an underwater-based science fiction adventure. Now, the main character, Troy Tempest, who you can see there, was physically based on James Garner. I've got to say the phones, the radio operator on this side looks a lot like Robert Ryan to me. But Stingray's Great has got a terrific theme song, which is a bit repetitive in the lyrics, but it was written by Barry Gray, who did a lot of work with Jerry and Sylvia Anderson for a very long time, and has a really great 1960s production music sound about it. 
Now, Stingray is a nuclear-powered combat submarine. It's a flagship of the World Aquatic Security Patrol, WASP, which is a kind of unfortunate acronym for two reasons, one of which is that there are those associations with white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and also wasps are insects, they're not underwater creatures. Sea wasps, yeah, that's a different thing. The World Aquanaut Security Patrol is a branch of the World Security Patrol, responsible for policing the Earth's oceans in the mid-2060s. I think a lot of right-wing nutjobs would have problems with global police forces, but we'll leave that aside for now. It was in the 1960s. The submarine is pretty well equipped too. It's got Sting missile torpedoes that, and it can travel up to 600 knots underwater, which is 1,100 kilometers an hour and reach depths of over 36,000 feet. So they probably could have rescued the Titan submarine. Stingray is based in a self-contained city of Marineville located several miles inland somewhere on the west coast of North America. It's connected to the Pacific Ocean via a tunnel leading to an ocean door through which Stingray is launched. Anything can happen in the next half hour. Now this one's got a bit of a Star Trek feel about it, even though it's set under the sea, because Stingray actually finds advanced civilizations under the ocean. And first of these ones is Titanic. I am Titan. Leader of the underwater city of Titanica. He commands the Aquafibians, a warrior race who possess a fleet of lethal submersibles called Mechanical Fish. Again, there's a bit of a failure of name calling there. Now, Stingray is attacked by Titan's forces and Troy and Phones, the radio operator, are captured. They're rescued by one of Titan's slaves, Marina, a mute young woman from the undersea city of Pacifica, who can breathe underwater. Marina defects to the Wasp and becomes a permanent member of the Stingray crew. Troy becomes infatuated with her, making his kind of topside wannabe girlfriend, Atlanta, jealous. And I've always got a problem with those series that have mute girlfriends in them. It happens again in Planet of the Apes a couple of years later. There's a certain kind of guy who's fantasizes about women who can't talk. And for me, that sounds a bit problematic. So the rest of the series is basically Stingray exploring underneath the ocean and finding other races, some of which are hostile, and stopping them from attacking Marineville and Stingray itself. So it's it's very basic. You remember this is a half-hour kids show. This is where Jerry and Sylvia Anderson start really lifting their production values. The sets are fantastic. The miniatures are fantastic. The submarines themselves work really well. The underwater landscapes they create and the underwater creatures they create are really great. This is Jerry and Sylvia Anderson gearing up for their biggest series of this type, Thunderbirds. And they're kind of gathering their, their crew and getting the skills up to really be able to do adventure storytelling on a big scale, in a very small scale. Now, the next series we've got is from 1967. It comes just after Thunderbirds. And it's Captain Scarlet and the Mysterons, which has got a slightly more adult feel about it. Again, they're, they're going 100 years in the future, just for convenience sake. In the first episode, Earth makes a big boo-boo. They've got a Zero X spaceship, which lands on Mars and finds a city on Mars. Martians see the exploration vehicle, which is like a big sealed tank. And they turn their optical surveillance instruments towards it. The humans from Earth, of course, decide that they're going to be attacked and they blow the city up. What they don't know is the Martian civilization is incredibly advanced and rebuilds the city in a minute or two. And suddenly Earth and Mars are at war. The city's inhabitants are the Mysterons and they don't take being blasted very lightly. The leader of the Mars mission is a Spectrum agent called Captain Black, who gets taken over by the Mysterons and becomes their lead agent on their attacks on Earth. They also take over Captain Scarlet, another one of the agents. Captain Scarlet starts sabotaging various installations on Earth. There's a little bit of a catch here. During a very elaborate assassination attempt on the President of Earth, Captain Scarlet falls from a giant tower and dies, but because he has the Mr. On's mojo, he can't be killed. Anything that happens to him he will regenerate from and heal. And when he does heal, he is no longer under the Mysterons' control, and he becomes the lead character in fighting the Mysterons as they come to Earth. And you never actually see the Mysterons themselves. All you see are two circles of light traveling across things and a very deep 
scary voice. And that kind of works. You've got Mistron agents and, and people taken over by the Mistron, so you can use your normal marionettes for that. But you never actually see the aliens, and that makes it even cooler. It's a trope that they continued in UFO a few years later. But Captain Scarlet has so much going for it. The production values, again, are really fantastic. You've got the sky base with the jet fighters run by the angels, a whole bunch of women. You've got the Spectrum Pursuit Vehicles, which are big, tanky kind of trucks. And you've got the groovy Spectrum Saloon Cars. Really great red roadsters. And I'd love to have a full-size electric Spectrum Saloon Car. I think they're a groovy design. And very kind of jet-set 1960s in the, in the best possible way. Now, the miniatures and the miniature sets are really good. And the puppetry keeps getting better. In Stingray, the, the heads are a little bit bigger because of the solenoids needed to move the eyes and the mouths. And the eyebrows and things like that required a fairly large head. But in Captain Scarlet, the heads are more to human scale. That really benefits the, the kind of plausibility of these creatures as human beings. Um, Captain Scarlet's voiced by Francis Matthews, a, a character actor who turned up in all sorts of things, including Benny Hill at one stage. But this is really great filmmaking. Half-hour action adventures filmed with miniatures and explosions and really great production design, really great set design, really great vehicle designs as well. And also it has a, a groovy theme song, which hasn't really dated. I mean, you could still play this in a disco as a DJ and have people really groove to it. Uh, it. It's just wonderful stuff. And for me, apart from Thunderbirds, this is the kind of peak of Jerry and Sylvia Anderson's Super Marionation work. It really lands well. It's a little more gritty and grounded. It's a little more grown up. And for me, it worked. I watched a few episodes of it a couple of days ago. And you can see from the cover of this what I mean about the heads. The heads are a little more human size compared to the bodies and that works well and on the back you can see even more of it there it really works now in the early 2000s there was also a computer generated captain scarlet series which wasn't too bad uh the the computers generated animation was fairly good but it just didn't have the same mojo as the original series now this one actually has special features it's got audio commentaries on the mistrons and attack on cloud base by jerry anderson uh, making of documentary Cloud Base and Angel Interceptor, Captain Scarlet and the Golden Shot, photo stories, TV21 audio adventures, alternative opening titles, TV adverts and publicity, text guide stills gallery, character identities, DVD ROM material featuring a guide to all of the cool stuff on there, and the TV21 comics. So there are extras on this one. Let me just check. Stingray also had some extras, but I'll put them up on the screen for you now. Me, the equal third in this series is Joe Knighty, which is a kind of unusual one. It's from the late 1960s. And I'll read this off Wikipedia. It follows the exploits of nine year old schoolboy Joe McLean, who becomes a spy after his adoptive father invents a device capable of recording expert knowledge and experience and transferring it to another human brain. Armed with the skills of the world's top academic and military minds, Joe is recruited by the World Intelligence Network as its most special agent. Most of the experts think that this series is set around 2012-2013. For me, it, it kind of doesn't work. If you've got a machine that can do that, why don't you get a grown-up secret agent to get all of this knowledge crammed into it? He said, why does it have to be a nine-year-old boy? Yes, I know the series is aimed at children, and particularly boys. And so having a viewpoint character who is a nine-year-old boy has a certain charm about it. But people liked Thunderbirds, and people liked Stingray, and people liked Captain Scarlet. They didn't need to have a kid protagonist in there to, to sell a series. Now, the machine that Joe Knighty uses to gain these skills is called the Brain Impulse Galvanoscope Record and Transfer. And that acronym comes out as Big Rat. I'm sure they could have found a better acronym there. Now, the production designs are good, and the machine Big Rat is pretty groovy as well. But... It doesn't really land for me for lack of a good central character. The kid they got to do the voice acting for Joe just didn't bring it. And for me, this is the weakest of them all, probably. 
with the possible exception of Fireball XL5, which I think is better than this. I'm going, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that, that Fireball XL5 is better than Joe 90. Now, this one has special features, character biographies, information files, warning sequence footage, Joe's glasses. They got a location record because they did do some live action locations to mix with the miniatures and the um, marionettes. Original artwork and a bunch of other stuff as well. So there is, there is uh, a bit of extra stuff there. Jerry and Sylvia Anderson did do another series after this called The Secret Service, which featured Stanley Unwin, a very eccentric actor playing a vicar who's also a secret agent, but it didn't work very well and didn't last very long and it's all but forgotten. But this box set has a ton of fun in it and a ton of really rewatchable old episodes of these series and the wonderfulness of the marionette work and the super marionation and Derek Medigzetal doing the miniatures and the production design and all that. For a studio that worked on a fairly small scale, they really punched out some really interesting television. And at least as interesting as a lot of the action series that were coming out around the same time that were live action. In some ways, the 1960s was a golden age of action television series in the UK. This is a good box set of the kiddie end of it, but still really punchy and fun children's series, which we're all a little prone to be nostalgic about. So thanks again to Viavision for giving me this review copy of the, all of these series. They were fun to revisit. And I'm going to go back and watch some more episodes, particularly of Captain Scarlet, because I think that one's the most grounded and the most interesting, for me at least, of all of those series. And it's nice to just sit back and, and chuck a disc in and maybe watch a couple of back-to-back -back episodes of Captain Scarlet when I'm in the mood for that. Maybe on a Sunday morning while I'm eating my cereal. But So that's it. So thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and hit the notification bell. Tell me which one of these series you like the most and whether you think that my ranking of them captain scarlet stingray a fireball xl5 and then joe 90 is the right rating for these in in order of quality you can also support the channel by donating at patreon.com slash terry talks movies I've, I've actually got an extra video this week the next one i've got for you is the alphabetical hidden gem movies i'm doing the letters i and j and i've just selected the movies for that I'm also doing an extra video this week where I am reviewing the elephants in the room of cinema at the moment, which are the Barbie movie at Oppenheimer. I'm doing a Barbie Heimer episode sometime during the week. I've got a big haul from Imprint Viavision that I'm reviewing and unboxing on the Wednesday video. So you're going to get an extra video this week. And then we go back to science fiction Saturday once more. So until then, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Dive into some old Sunday morning watching while you have breakfast TV series. And I'll catch you next time. <laughs>